So River Run Trail is your path to a brighter future. There it goes. So anyway, I know most of you, Michelle Duff, um, I'm the fellow Kiwanian of this whole, I'm the wife of John, the mother to uh, Libby and Danny Duff, if we haven't met. Um, I can't, looking around the room, I can't think of one of you I haven't met, so thank you. Good to see you all. Now, this is me. It's about a six-year-old version of me, but, <laughs> but it is me. And um, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is how I got here. Um, so like many of you, I started off in business. In fact, corporate sales was where I came from. I um, went to school at Oregon State University and graduated with a degree in history. Well, I taught for a, a short term and realized I have no business being in a classroom. <laughs> so if you graduate with history and you're not going to be a teacher or a museum curator, what do you do? You hightail it to Southern California and live on your brother's floor for three months. Sleep on his floor for three months. You then ask said brother to get you a job. And so my brother helped me get a job in a furniture manufacturing company called Hyatt Furniture Manufacturing. My client was Pottery Barn. So as a 20-some-year-old, that was a great job. I got to travel all over the all over the nation and do trainings at Pottery Barn stores. Shortly after that, I um, started working for the Subaru of America as a district liaison um, to Southern or, or Southern California district. Sorry for Gary. I did live in California for a while. Um, <laughs> But something was missing. Something was greatly missing, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, around that time, John and I met. I moved back up to Oregon, long story short. We moved to Redmond in 2002, jumped in with both feet into many service organizations, Kiwanis being the very first and um, probably the most impactful in our, in our journey together. Um, and just finally, about a month ago, I ended up at Rim Rock Trails. It's a great place for me to be because it combines the sales and communications and trainings that I was able to do, but I get to serve one of our most vulnerable populations in, in um, Central Oregon, and it's a great marriage for me. Okay, so I will talk about Rimrock Trails, but first of all, I want to talk about the very fun topic of mental health and mental illness. Okay, so what is mental illness? A mental health disorder is any disorder that causes a person to experience different behaviors than their norm or an altered mood or pattern of thinking. And what does it look like? Well, as you can see, it can look like anything. It can be anything from um, anxiety, a small bit of anxiety, <coughs> to the, we've talked about um, the baby blues before, or it can be as severe as a schizo schizophrenia. As you can see, there's many different types of illnesses. But what's most important to know about mental illness is it's biological. It is not, it is something, just like if you had diabetes or cancer <coughs> or scoliosis, having a mental illness is biological, it's in our genes. Um, but as you guys know, often we, we forget about that and instead we think of the stigma around it. We have some false kind of ideas about it. So let me, let me see if you guys know what false, what some of the false ideas are. Let's take a quiz, but you don't really have to take a quiz. <laughs> um, mental illness occurs only in adults. False. That's right, false. And in fact, <coughs> mental disorders and mental illnesses present by 14 years of age in most, in most persons. Schizophrenia being different than that because schizophrenia is a little bit later in the teen years. <coughs> I'll tell you more about that probably. Um, mental health problems make people violent and unpredictable. Uh, yes. Only um, two to three percent of violent acts are actually carried out by somebody with a diagnosed mental illness. Um, people with mental illnesses can't handle a job. False. We know that's false because um, <laughs> if one in four of us have a mental illness, there would be a lot fewer people working, right? So we know that one's false. And uh, mental health problems result from character flaws, personality weaknesses, or a lack of discipline. False. No, isn't that where the stigma comes in for so many? And isn't that where the stigma comes from people not getting the treatment they want because they don't want to be judged for character flaws, personality weaknesses, or lack of discipline? What are the real facts? So one of four of us will experience a mental health problem of some sort. Mental illnesses, like we talked about, are medical illnesses, not just mental illnesses, if you can put the two together. Sadly, less than a third of us actually will go get treatment if we're diagnosed. Um, let's say our healthcare provider diagnoses us and says, you know, 
I really think you have some depression. Why don't you go talk to someone? Only a third of persons will actually go get treatment for and some help. And sadly, 90% of people who commit suicide um, have a diagnosable mental disorder that can be treated. So you guys are probably like Michelle, this is really depressing. Thanks for the lift up on a sunny, beautiful day. But don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, oh, what I'm a slide ahead of myself. Why don't you why should we care? Um, we should care because one in four of us, as we said, has a mental illness and six and one in six of our kiddos do. That's for the individual. The impact on the family, 8.4 million families or people in the US or families um, actually take care or give care to somebody with a mental illness. The community, we've um, 193.2 billion lost in earnings each year. That's a, that's a tremendous amount of economic um, oppression on a, any community. It prevents us from thriving as communities. And finally, the world. Depression and anxiety cost the global community one trillion in lost productive, productivity each year. Now, it's not about the money, is it? But it's oh, somewhat about the money because that strains all of our other services, from our hospitals to our law enforcement um, and, and whatnot. Now, now, why am I depressing? But it works. <laughs> That's the good news. The good news is it works. That most mental illnesses, in fact, 80% of people that go and get treatment, will um, either fully recover or will find, um, will be able to manage their symptoms. So it works. Now, let's talk about mental illness or men, uh, mental health in Central Oregon. We, uh, we're not out of the woods, guys. We have a, a few little problems here. We have two few qualified professionals, and let's look at Redmond by itself. So we have, what, about 30,000 um, population for Redmond? Now, if one of, in four of us has a mental illness, that means there's about 7,500 of us here living amongst one another that is working with some sort of, can be anything from depression to a bipolar disorder, any, you know, some, some sort of mental illness. So, in Redmond proper, we only have 60 um, individuals that are licensed therapists or qualified therapists. Now, um, it used to be in Oregon, you could, you could work in Oregon as a therapist and just hang a, sh hang a shingle. There are now much stronger certifications and licensures, but we only have 60. For a population of 7,500 persons that needs help, we really need 250. So that's just, that's just in Redmond. Now think about all of Central Oregon, Jefferson and um, Deschutes County, meaning Bend and Lapine. So we really just have a, 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 a terrible shortage. Um, unaffordable or uninsured mental health services. It's getting better, as many of you have insurance as health insurance, it is getting better that more and more um, services are covered, um, but there's a large population in, that um, can't afford insurance in our, in our midst. In fact, the people we work with, 80% of the persons we work with are uh, either, um, are uninsured, and so they come from impoverished homes. So what are they to do? because they certainly can't afford the 100 to $200 visit to get their treatment. Okay, and again, this is something we kind of talked about. They said a third, only 20% of individuals in Central Oregon actually get some help. So, there's hope. And the hope comes in the form of the rock trails. <laughs> so from Rock Hills, our mission to provide comprehensive evidence-based treatment service for individuals and families affected by mental health and substance use issues. We create a foundation for healing, strengthen family connections, and offer hope for a brighter future. So let me tell you a little bit about how we came to be. In Crook County, um, some school administrators, commissioners, and law enforcement got together in, um, this in the early eight, or early to late 80s, and they said, why is there so little substance use treatment and mental health treatment for adolescents? And to put, they put, so they put together um, Rim Rock Trails, and in 1990, we became a 501c3. So we've been around for about three decades now. Um, and I believe in 1990, oh, and, and we, we were up in the old Pioneer Memorial Hospital. Have, does, are any of you familiar with um, Pineville? I worked in that hospital for Lutheran Community Services, and so <laughs> I'm very familiar with that hospital that now sends empty. Um, but anyway, they, um, 
1998, they were able to purchase land on Ninth Street in Frankville, and that became part of the residential facility. Um, they then, about four years after that, were able to purchase additional an additional building next to the residential treatment service that had weight room, gym, uh, classrooms, and business offices. So the flagship office now resides in Prineville. We have 45 employees and a board of directors of nine. Most of those individuals are from Prineville, Cook County. We do have one Redmond representative and one Bend representative. We have two open spots, so I'm trying to find someone from Redmond. So if you hear of anybody looking for a good volunteer or board position, we could really use more representation as we're expanding here. Okay, so we have two programs. We're mostly known for our adolescent residential treatment program in Crook County that I was telling you about. However, we also have outpatient counseling services in Redmond, Bend, and Prineville, meaning we have clinics that is more like the natural, normal counseling you see, the hour appointment, the 45 minute appointment, um, which is outpatient, so people come once a week, once a month, depending on their assessment. Now, does anybody, just for fun, does anybody know where the Redmond office is? From our trails office? Becky Johnson Center? No, but it, no. It's on Highway 126, which is about a block up from the high school, so it's really, really good. <laughs> really good, perfect area. So now when you're going past Chevron, look to your right, and you'll be sure to see it. Okay, so let me tell you about our residential treatment. I need to put less buttons on this thing. <laughs> oh, went too far. Okay, this is our residential treatment service. This is the first building that was built that I told you about. This was the second. So this is our Prineville flagship office, and this is what we're best known for. Like I said, we've been there since 1990. This serves adolescents with severe substance use and co-occurring mental health problems, ages 12 through 17 year, uh, years. Um, we've served over 3,000 individuals in that facility um, since we've been there. And um, not only does it have um, you know, the therapy that you would expect, but we also have GED recovery programs, and also um, we do a lot of enhancements, so enhancement programs or classes. So we teach people to knit, we go out and do, um, go to healing rings and do, go horseback riding. We do a lot of different things to support them in their recovery. The recovery can last anywhere from 30 to 90 days, um, depends on the, how the person's doing in their recovery. Now, um, this is another fun fact. How many beds do you, so we have 24 beds in our facility that we can house. 24 residents. How many beds would you think that um, the state of Oregon might have for, for adolescent residential kiddos? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gary's exactly right. <coughs> Gary, where's more chocolate for you? <laughs> um, we, there's only 80 beds in the whole state of Oregon, um, and we're 24 here in Central Oregon. We also have um, one of um, only five in the whole state of Oregon that has an adolescent residential treatment. The need is great all over, not just here in Oregon. Um, the, most of the kiddos, um, we are in Prineville, um, but we serve all of the Northwest, so Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, we have kids um, referred to us all, from all over. Having said that, most of the kids that are in our programs are from Redmond and Bend. Okay, so now our outpatient counseling offices. Redmond, Bend, and Prineville. So, like I said, our outpatient, that's the more normal counseling office that you think of when you go to get treatment for depression, anxiety, um, those kinds of things. And um, we have served, I, I want to say we've served over 10,000 individuals in these programs. Now, some people will want to know about funding. This is always important. We are um, funded with contract revenue that comes from Pacific Source. Now, um, Pacific Source has been a great friend to us. They did a, they used to do a captivated, a cap, captivated, not captivated, capitation. <laughs> <laughs> they are very captivating, but <laughs> they used to do a captivated, captation. I'm just not going to say it anymore. I'm just keep going. <laughs> um, they used to, now we do, as of July 1st, 2019, it is now fees for service, which as most of us are fiscally responsible, so we, we like that, right? You get paid for the fees you provide. The only problem is, is that their fees are about eight years old in, for what they pay us. So let's say uh, uh, to see one individual costs $175 for an appointment. 
they'll only pay us about 85% of that. Um, or, I'm sorry, $85 out of that 175 So uh, we have to make up the difference. And that's why I was hired on, because we need some alternative revenue sources. Um, about 3% of his fundraising, here I can give you the exact numbers. So 68% comes from a contract, 8% comes from fees for service, that's what our, actually our clients can pay us, 3% for fundraising, and about 21% in grants. So that's pretty much how it, it's a, that's a very simple version of how we're funded. And anybody that's in the medical field and knows insurance knows there's it's much more complicated than that. But that's us. So we have so, I've been there, so I was doing some consulting. I left Lutheran in July and I did consulting for about four months. And around November we decided this is becoming a bigger job than just what a consultant can handle. And they brought me on December 1st. And just in that time, since I've been there since, in, since in, from August, we've had some major things happen. Um, on October 1st, we started counseling for all ages. So I told you we were, our specialty was adolescents, 12 through 17 years of age. We realized that the need was so great for getting qualified, um, qualified persons, uh, therapists or clinicians, mental health workers in our area, that we are now serving all ages, from zero to 150. Um, a volunteer program. We've never, we've had, we have a ton of volunteers helping us all the time, but we've never had a, 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 a organized program. So Darlene Rogers over in Prineville is helping us. She's running our program for us. And as of January 1, we now have an actual organized program um, that people, that all individuals are able to come and help. Well, if you're 21 and you pass a background and a urine test, you can come help. <laughs> Um, Prineville relocation, this is exciting. So next, actually this week we're moving our, our, per, our counseling office, our outpatient counseling office that I was telling you about in Prineville was on site with the residential facility. Well, you can imagine that creates quite a bit of problems for our residents. So we are moving our Prineville um, counseling office to downtown um, on, on right there on 3rd Street. So we're really excited about that. Um, in the Redmond office locally, we hired a woman named Jackie Taylor. She's a licensed professional counselor that is, has her specialty as young children. Sadly, 4.8 um, million kiddos from the ages of three to seven are diagnosed with a mental illness, um, whether it could be because of trauma or whatnot. And so she actually has um, you know, specialty in that area. So our hope is that our Redmond office becomes the hub for children's counseling. We will counsel all ages there still, but to really, um, to be, there's very little children's counseling in Central Oregon, and so this could be a really impactful experience for Redmond. Um, okay, our Central Oregon pilot project. As I was telling you, um, only about 20% of persons are actually get referred to, um, to, they get referred, but they actually only go, they only go to treatment once referred. So what we are doing, we're working with um, St. Charles, and we, or, I'm sorry, we're Weeks Family Medicine in Highland, um, Highland Desert. High Desert. High Desert, thank you. <laughs> High Desert. Um, we're working with them to actually have a navigator in their offices. So that navigator, once the person, a doctor says, hey, we think you should go see somebody, that navigator's on site to get that person into services. Um, another thing we're doing is we're, we're actually going into Mosaic Medical and doing counseling right there in the clinics because we know that that is a huge barrier of once somebody's referred to actually getting services. So those are a couple of things we're working on, and that was a grant from the Central Oregon Health Council. Finally, um, we were talking about we're looking for other alternative revenue sources. We're starting a Rim Rock Royalty Club. That's our monthly giving program, so we're just growing that. It's just in its, its infancy stages, but as anybody knows, I know Jenny, you know, consistent and sustainable funding, um, it, it can't be monthly giving because you can count on it and then you can grow your programs through having it. And then finally, um, our first ever Central Oregon fundraising luncheon, a life-changing lunch. We're going to be having that in May, May 29th, which is also happens to be Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, we are having it. Thank you, Josh and John. They're going to be some sponsors for us. Um, but we are having that in Crick County, as that's where our flagship office is. But as uh, you've seen from our present presentation today, we serve all of Central Oregon. So we're inviting 
anyone to come. So if you'd like more information about that, you know, please come see me. How am I doing for time, Ben? Oh, well, <laughs> I hope you guys have some questions. <laughs> okay, so change of life. I've told you about our volunteer program. Um, I don't, I'm just going to read here because I don't want you to, to miss out. Because a lot of people think, oh, well, I have nothing to volunteer. But actually, we, there's a lot of different areas. Um, we have art or recreation that we, we need volunteers for that, including like weightlifting, playing cards, yoga, coming in and playing board games. Our kiddos um, are often very, very lonely. They, they're away from their families. Um, some of their families don't come to visit them on the, the, time, the Sunday visit times. And so we always need people to come in and just kind of hang out, you know, hang out and tell them, let them know they're important. Um, a teaching skill, such as um, uh, personal finance or um, interviewing for jobs, applying for jobs, inter you know, um, how to find those jobs. Uh, we need volunteers to help with that. Wellness volunteers, such as uh, yoga, mindfulness, um, those date, how dating and relationships, because once they're out, how do they navigate? Um, we want them to have skills so that they feel more com confident in what they do. Um, and again, the requirements is to, is to pass a background if Jack can be 21 years of age. Okay, a couple more clicks here. Um, what do we need? Donated items, especially winter items. Our kiddos, you know, I said that 80% of them come in impoverished or homeless families. They don't have a lot of clothing when they come in. So we always are looking for clothing donations, especially warm coats for what the winter activities. You're always welcome to contribute financially. It's not about the money, but it's always about the money because we need the money to keep going, right? Um, we are very self so we are a very healthy organization. We give at least I'm um, 75% back to our programming though, so. Yeah, before I get to that, I do have a sign-up sheet. I send out a digital newsletter that, that updates all of this information for you. If you'd like to receive it, it comes out once a month and you can um, unsubscri um, unsubscribe <laughs> anytime. But if you'd like um, to receive that, I'm gonna pass this around. Feel free to put your email on there for me. And then questions, you guys. If I did really poorly, there's chocolate on the tables. So. <laughs> yes, Linda. Uh, I don't hear anything about uh, Jefferson County in your uh, talk. So, who does Jefferson County is being part of such a play in your clientele? So, we do have um, Best Care Treatment Services up there and a couple other in, um, partners that we work with that will refer the kiddos, the, the adolescents, to us. We do not have a counseling office in Jefferson County at this time, but we do get referrals for our residential treatment program. How do you interface with the schools? That's 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 a good question. <laughs> so we're there, our school is actually run by the Crook County School District. So once a kiddo comes from Deschutes County into Crook County, they're automatically a Crook County student. So and the Crook County School District is very aware of us and knows what we do. We are um, doing our best to to um, do more outreach to the to the Redmond and Ben um, districts, but um, but our outpatient. Um, Counseling programs are full, so we're, something's working right. Um, we were, remember Clear Alliance was here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Clear Alliance came to speak with us a couple weeks ago. Now Clear Alliance does a really good job of prevention. So we rely on them to do the work of prevention in the schools. Um, we do the treatment. And so we let the counselors know, if you have an individual that it has a difficulty, refer them to us. Yeah. Lenny? Yes, Dick. You have a program for measuring success? And yes, so what and how? Well, we do know that um, if, if people get treatment, we can say if adolescents get treatment, 60% of them will not go into um, using, uh, go into uh, adult addiction. Uh, we know that from our studies and our what we do. 80% um, we know if they get treatment for mental illness will, um, will get better. And what, if you, are you wondering about what happens to the other 20%? Often the other 20% is an SPMI, which is a severe and persistent mental illness. Those are the persons that um, can, they can be cared for, but generally they're on a heavy medication, and if they don't take that medication, um, the treatment fails. Yes? Can you, you told me this a little bit, but can you, when a, when a, when a 
student is referred to Rimrock Trails, and they're staying at that facility. Can you talk, to the, talk through that process that they enter the door, how long they're there, and what they have to do to graduate out of it, and what it's like to be in that so they can't go anywhere. Right, right. So. Yeah. Now, we're not a lockdown facility, um, but we are a, we are a expe expectation that you stay in the facility. So a kiddo is referred from um, many different sources. It could be a family who is just out of their wit's end and doesn't know what to do with their kiddo that's hurting so badly, or it could be um, man court mandated that a judge says you need to get you need to get help. Um, so we do an assessment. Everybody that comes through our doors, whether in both programs, go through an assessment. We decide what they need. Do they need outpatient counseling, um, or do they need residential treatment? When, if they're in residential treatment, they come in. Um, they're not allowed to bring any. Um, they're not allowed to bring any paraphernalia with them, of course. But also, we have to be very strict about what kind of um, um, pencils, pens, anything that can be used as a weapon cannot be brought in. And so they have to be very, very creative, or not creative, but very cognizant of what they come with. And so usually it's just clothing. That's pretty much all they can bring. That's why books and board games that we have there are so important. Um, once they are there, they, their dorm rooms, they sleep um, about two or three, four persons in a, in a room. We do have camera systems, so everything except the restrooms are monitored for their safety. Um, we do, like I said, we do not lock them in, but the expectation is that they are there and Often they're far away from their families even. So um, there's not really a place for, for them to go. And that's kind of the advantage of having the facility in Greenville because if it were in Redmond, who do you think would be coming around? <laughs> their friends, right? Their friends that they are doing the drugs with would be coming around. So, um, um, so yeah, that's, a, that's pretty much what it is like. Um, like I said, 30 to 90 days, and that's usually what insurance is what cuts off their time with us. Um, and, but they get therapy, they get schooling, uh, at different um, enrichment activities, and once to, to be graduated, the, their clinician has to say, this person is, we do not believe this person needs residential treatment anymore, but they will have to have um, aftercare. Yes, Jenny. Do you think that 30 to 90 days is long enough for a treatment period for these children? Sometimes we don't, but their insurance dictates that. So it's, it, that's, that's a hard part for us because sometimes we have to let kids go even if they're insured, if we don't believe that they're quite ready. Yes, Do you have a lockdown room if they are considered dangerous or do you not take a dangerous person like schizophrenic? No, if we feel unsafe or if we feel they're unsafe to themselves or others, we call the police. So we do not, we do not, um, we don't lay our hands on the kiddos and we do not forcibly lock them in. Can you keep a kiddo past 90 days? Or past, past a trip? What if the kid's making great progress and, but they're in that middle, middle ground, can you, can you use other funding besides insurance to keep them? No, unfortunately with our beds, it's a OHP comes, or Medicaid, Medicaid comes first and so, um, by the contract of our state, we have to take OHP kids first. Um, if, a per, if a parent has private insurance, um, they can they could pay for it, but it's two hundred dollars a day to, for one kiddo to live to be in the facility. So not many parents, especially that our clientele, can afford that kind of a to keep it going. Any other questions, Dan? Uh, there's a growing population of non-English speaking. So like, is there a Spanish speaking uh, service within Rimrock Trail? So we have a translation service that we contract with, but all over, and I bet a lot of other people can speak to this, all over there's a huge push. You know, our, our documentation and whatnot is in Spanish, but we don't have a speaking, a Spanish speaking counselor. So it's very, it's not great therapy. It's not great clinically, because what we have to do is, is they, they have, there's a translator on the phone <laughs> that has to translate what the individuals say. So we're constantly looking for um, persons that are Spanish speaking to help with that population. Yeah, it's not, it's not ideal, but we're working on it. 
Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks,